Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the Black Girl, Black Woman in Architecture series. If you're new here, my name is Morgan Medley, and I am a high school senior at Enloe High School, which is located in Raleigh, North Carolina, um, with the dreams and aspirations of becoming an architect. I am also the founder of Black Girls Draw, and my program works to expose elementary aged girls to the world of architecture. Black Women in Architecture series highlights African-American women architects over the last few months. Um, I've had the opportunity to meet some really fabulous women in this field that I want to be in. Um, each month, they've lifted my hopes and dreams of being a part of what they are a part of. And tonight um, is my pleasure to introduce Ms. Verche Height. Um, Ms. Height holds an architecture degree from both the University of North Carolina in Charlotte and the University of um, Westminster and London, England. Her academic and professional career have exposed her to a range of unique experiences throughout the United States and abroad that carefully constructed her compassion perspectives on the relationships between design and human condition. Upon graduation, her work at, um, with the award winning, fir winning firms like the Freelon Group, Perkins and Will, and now Vines Architecture, has yielded a professional portfolio characterized by complex cultural projects, historic renovations, libraries, and higher education products. As an associate at Vines Architecture, Verche is an active member of the American Institute of Architects Triangle Chapter, serving as both chair of design awards and co-chair of Women in Architecture Task Forces. She is also a board member um, for the North Carolina National Organization of Minority Architects, a commence, commencer with the Raleigh Historic Development Commission, um, and a lecturer with the School of Architecture at North Carolina State University. Let us welcome Ms. Verche Height. Hi, Morgan. Hi, how are you? I'm doing great, how are you? I'm good. Good. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. Thank you for letting me have you because this is this is really big. <laughs> for me too. <laughs> so tonight I'm just going to ask you a few questions and then later on we'll get into our other special guests. So first I just want to start off with asking where you're originally from. I am originally from Richmond, Virginia. Um, sometimes it feels like I'm from North Carolina because I've been in North Carolina since uh, 2004. Um, but I was born and raised in Richmond, Virginia. So um, what were your interests in like elementary school through high school? Um, oh man, I was interested in so many things. Um, my parents were really wonderful about making sure that I had a taste of whatever I thought I might want to do um, or be in the future. Um, so everything from like different sports activities, I remember swimming lessons, tennis lessons, um, you know, ping pong, all kinds of stuff, um, basketball, all the way through on the academic side to looking at the sciences, looking at art, um, mathematics, um, my mom um, is a, has an English degree, a communications degree, um, and an English minor. And so she was always bringing that sort of like book learning, um, you know, really interested in words and the way that, that sentences come together, that stories come together. And my father was more of the, the math side. Um, and he actually, but a hands-on kind of math guy too, uh, because he is an automotive uh, professor and technician. Um, so and has moved up and built his career off of that. So I spent a lot of time um, when I wasn't sort of exploring those activities in a garage, uh, watching my dad work on cars and learn how to teach students about that. Um, so kind of that, that, that hybrid <laughs> of things going on in my background. Yeah, when it comes to me and my parents, my dad, like like you said, my dad is really big on like math and education. And then my mom, she's more of like, she loves reading books. I, she has so many books in like this one closet. It's it's scary. But yeah, and they always put us in just different extracurricular activities or just like, if ever, when I said I had an interest in law when I was all through middle school, they would put me in law camps all summer which like you know geared me more towards that and it was like I guess they just wanted us to get a taste of what we liked and what we didn't like and if we didn't like it it was just okay at least you got the experience and then if you did like it okay it was like you can stick with it and keep going through the program so I think that's one of the reasons that 
I've just had so many different programs and I've just done so many different things in different, completely different fields. I used to do volleyball and softball. I've danced. I've done so many, like, this is women in transportation program that I used to do. And we would just talk about like the construction of the roads. And then I did this program called MSCN and they had robotics. And at one point I was interested in like computer engineering and stuff. So it's just, it's been all over the place, but now that I've told them that I want to do architecture and I've stuck with it all through high school, they've put me in a lot of um, architecture camps. Like this summer, I did um, the NOMA camp um, held by, I think, NC State. And then I did the hip hop architecture camp. Yeah. Yeah. And now I'm doing the ACE program that's like year long. And like I've taken all the classes I can take. So I think with them being so like big on education, they've helped me gear myself towards what I want to do, whether it, if I changed it or not. So um, when did you first have exposure to arch architecture and design? Can you oh, hear me? Can you hear me? Sorry, I think I, I think I froze. Okay. Um, I asked, when did you have okay. the first experience of architecture and design? Oh, my first experience with architecture and design. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll tie it in to what we were just talking about. Um, and that is, you know, the when you experiment with all of these different things growing up, um, realizing that um, I definitely had like a heavier leaning toward the arts and the sciences side of things, but I was really interested and enamored with all of the things that people do. And so architecture in a way ended up being the perfect fit because when you work with clients, you know, you're not working with architects when you're working with other people, you're, you're building structures. And there's no limit on who you can serve with what you, what you with what your skills are. Um, so it's kind of like, it's nice because you can keep investigating and keep diving into um, other people's world and what they're working on and what they're doing um, and figuring out how to serve them through design. Um, so I think my first formal exposure to architecture, I was probably, pretty late, it was probably in college, um, in the college courses that I had. Um, that is what I would say formally. I think leading up to that in high school, it was, I really got into my art classes uh, quite deeply. And um, with the art program that I ended up being in, my senior year, I had to create an actual like exhibit for people to experience. And what I realized is that I used, and what I ended up designing was, surfaces that played with opacity, you know, transparency, light, texture, all of these things and position them in really strategic ways. So I was trying to manipulate space in my own way through these like art experiences. And it turned out that that was very architectural. Um, and then just marrying that with, you know, again, growing up in Richmond, you know, have lots of family all over the place between Richmond and, um, the Maryland area and then starting to go south to Petersburg and, you know, noticing that as you grow up anywhere, right? Like there's some areas that, man, like this is beautiful. I wish I could be in this area all the time. There's some areas that's just like, you know, why does this look like this? And I remember riding in the car with my mom and we were going, you know, we we're on a trip and I was like, mom, why are some places like so nice and some places not so nice? Like who's in charge of this? Like who's in charge of the way this stuff looks? And she told me, you know, architects, you know, are the vision visionaries for this. And I was like, that's, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna figure out, <laughs> I'm gonna figure out a way to impact this so that we can kind of bring a, a level of equality mm -hmm. <laughs> to the way that spaces look. Um, so it was just, that was like my experience of architecture and, you know, going to museums and traveling with my parents and then having the art education, but then the formal architecture intro introduction was more so in college. So what classes did you take in um, high school? Um, I took, so I was in um, what they call the International Baccalaureate Program. Um, mm -hmm. I went to Henrico High School. So go Warriors, shout out to Henrico High School. Um, and they had an International Baccalaureate Program there. And so through that program, what's interesting is it, there are a lot of magnet schools that you can go to, I guess, that focus on like math and science, or you go to another one that focuses on something else. And with what we call IB, 
all of your classes were taken to that higher level. So it didn't really matter what you wanted to study, like your science classes were gonna be up here, your math classes are gonna be up here. And the amazing thing is that my art classes had to be up here too. So the expectation of, you know, this sort of like, there, you couldn't do any like passive learning or just getting by. You really had to jump in, start investigating and start creating things even from, you know, freshman year. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, was, I was pretty fortunate in that way. And I think I, I was able to use that to kind of start to build the portfolio that you need to get into architecture school. Um, With my school, we have like just standard classes, like, I guess like classes that anybody could take, just general courses and then we have like our honors classes that are like a level above it and it's like you're learning the same thing it's just at, like a different pace and like the work is like a little harder and then we have our AP and we have our IB classes yep. and that's just like the like really top tier and then we also have like dual enrollment um kids that'll like they come that they're at in low like half a day and then they'll go like take some classes at Wake Tech or just like we have just different I guess college programs that also feed into like our high schools I guess that's what you want to call it Right. Yeah. My parents wanted me to um do that, but I think by the time like we realized it, it was kind of just like a little too late. Like all through high school, I've just taken like honors classes in all my classes. Yeah. Well, that's still a great foundation. Mm -hmm. And with my drafting classes, once I started taking, after I took like the standard drafting one class, mm -hmm. then when I took my engineering and architecture, they the higher I went, um, the more credit it went towards like my GPA and like the more the work got um, heavier and the workload got heavier and the more harder it got, which I actually really enjoyed because yeah. it was it was interesting to see how much like it would just change over the years. Absolutely. Well, and you're fortunate too because I don't remember a drafting class kind of being offered through my programs. And, you know, I know as, as you've talked to some of these amazing, I, I look up to all of the women that you have talked to so far. So I feel very honored that you asked to talk to me because I am a huge fan of all of them. Um, but I think when you, um, when you have the opportunity to do a drafting program and start to have the conversations about architecture and design at a high school level, it's really important. And I'm fortunate that, you know, I had my family and my parents kind of, you know, talk to me more in detail about architecture and, you know, send me on a path of investigation so I could figure it out. Um, but it would have been really beneficial to, again, have that opportunity to uh, explore it a little bit more in high school before jumping in in college. And like with most of the colleges that I've talked to, like when we went to go visit Howard and he was like naming off the stuff that like was, I guess it wasn't required to get into the school, but it was like, it would help if you knew what it was. Cause they have a lot of students that come into the program and like haven't even touched any of the software stuff that I've done. They like seem really shocked. And it's like crazy to think that most of the um, women that I've talked to didn't really have any type of drafting classes mm -hmm. when when I when they were my age, so it's like it's just weird to think how much it's changed over time and how like the art my century has so much opportunity, and it's just up for us to just like take it and run with it because if we don't, then that's really our fault because it's there for us. Yeah, absolutely. So and and that makes me really excited about you all being able to not only carry the baton but to hit some milestones even quicker so that, you know, when you're looking at the same point at the end, when you're looking back, you, you propel the profession even that much further forward. So I think that's wonderful. So um, when you were growing up, did you have any, like, once you figured out that's what you wanted to do, did you have any architects that you looked up to or like any, um, did you know any black woman that also did it? Uh, I did not know any other black female architects mm -hmm. um, growing up. Terry Canada, who you talked to, I think, uh, before Pascal, mm -hmm. she was one of the first Black female architects. She and Zena were the first two Black female architects that I met through my work with the Freeland Group. Um, so, you know, directly, I didn't necessarily, like, have that experience. Um, but again, I think what, what I tended to focus on through my studies and architecture was was the actual product of the built environment. So it was definitely more building based on, um, you know, the work that, you know, people like David Ajay and Zaha Hadid and, um, you know, Peter Zunther and, you know, some of those people were doing just in, you know, the Google searches and looking in the books and all of that was, was really wonderful um, mm -hmm. and very, very inspiring. I, I didn't realize, 
you know, really realizing that architecture could be so creative in its form and people could still kind of like exist in it and live in it, use it. Um, I, I was good with that to, to give it a try. <laughs> Um, in college, did you have any like specific classes that you had to take like for your freshman year? Was it more so just like general ed courses or was it more like you're taking a lot of like design and like history of architecture and art classes? So I think, you know, you mentioned that you were in some honors courses and I told you that I was in IB in um, high school. And one of the benefits of that is that some of the general education courses actually tested out of because I had high school requirements that covered it already. So that gave me the space to actually fill in some electives with some interesting topics. Um, you know, that were more design related. So I was able to pick up a minor in um, in urbanism. <laughs> So that was that was really, really cool to study that alongside architecture. So I went and filled in with that time. Um, but I would say most of my classes were um, architecture classes and part of the architecture curriculum. Um, I will say I did, you know, my swimming class. I took like a hip hop class. And you know, I was I also have a passion and a love for dance. So I always just tried mm -hmm. to you know, separate myself <laughs> from architecture sometimes and, and explore that physical side. Um, but yeah, the courses were mainly architecture. And I thought it was interesting, though, because I think what after being so enamored with like, the diversity in the built environment, I had an idea about what the classes would be like and what they were going to teach me. And I love that it was completely <laughs> different than what I thought it was going to be. Um, my freshman year, for example, I will never forget my first week of class. We sat in um, one of the galleries in the School of Architecture mm -hmm. and we literally like spent the class folding index cards. Um, and talking about, you know, how to lay out a page and, you know, what, what the meaning of a line is and proportion and, you know, and to anybody that would just walk in, you got a bunch of students sitting around folding index cards and you say, oh, this is architecture school. You're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> but I think that like foundation, like school really surprised me in that way. And, you know, the curriculum was geared around design thinking before you even got to the building. And so I just like, I don't know. Um, it was all architecture courses, but that's the kind of like dynamic, interesting, you know, architecture learning that you get to do. Um, I can't promise that there'll be index cards, but um, it'll be something. <laughs> so um, are you an arch are you a licensed architect yet? And if so, how was the process of going through it? And if not, how is the process going? So fortunately, I am a licensed architect. Um, and I love that I went ahead and just really, you know, closed everything out and did it. Mm -hmm. um, so I will say I did take the opportunity during my like um, my school, the two degrees that you mentioned that I've gotten. That's when I took the opportunity to also sort of do the travel and explore the world. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really do any architecture internships, um, but I just studied and researched and kind of lived life. Um, and then when I, <laughs> so I will mention, I graduated in 2009 with my third degree. I'm dating, I'm, people are like probably calculating my age now. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that was actually during the recession. Um, and so I was like, okay, what do I do now? I tried applying to get some jobs in architecture and I didn't have any success. Um, so that's when, because I had the fifth year kind of like accredited degree from UNC Charlotte, I decided, look, I'm just gonna take a year and I'm gonna go and I wanna get a master's degree and I'm gonna study cultural identity and architecture. So that's why I went over to the UK to study that. And of course, at the time I'm like, you know what, recession, it'll be over in a year and then I'll come back and then I'll get a job. Well, I came back and it wasn't over. <laughs> um, so what I did, um, my I still had trouble, you know, securing a job at the time. And my husband actually had a friend who worked um, in reality television in LA and they were shooting The Bachelorette um, in Charlotte. So oh, yeah. she was like, do you know anyone who needs a job? And I was like, I need a job. <laughs> so I um, I was a production assistant for one season for The Bachelorette in Charlotte mm -hmm. um, between school and working again. Um, it went well. It was a really interesting, interesting process. Um, 
I have very strong opinions about whether reality TV is actually real or not, but that's a conversation for another day. Um, so anyway, I, I finished my tenure on that and then um, I went, um, I was actually um, kind of in some talks still trying to put my resume out there to architecture firms. Um, and then I got a phone call um, from another company looking for another production assistant. And I was actually considering just kind of, all right, if that's the path, that's the open door, I need to be working, I'm gonna do that. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, um, probably five minutes after I got that phone call, I got a, fo a phone call from Phil Freelon offering me um, an internship at the Freelon Group. And so, uh, you know, I, I give a lot of credit to him for like, <laughs> for keeping me in the profession and giving me that sort of first opportunity. Um, so anyway, I worked there for a long time, um, for five years as it became freelance and production well. Mm -hmm. um, and I used that time to do my internship hours, get my, at the time it was called IDP, I now what's called AAP. Um, at that time also, the rules for getting licensed change all the time. And I'm sure by the time you work toward getting licensed, it's gonna change. Okay. But I fall in the group where you had to have finished like 3000 hours of work before you could sit for your exams. Um, so when that happened, I started sitting for my exams. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know if I mentioned, my husband is also a licensed architect in North Carolina. And what we did, we basically, we shut down our lives <laughs> for a year and a half. Um, so all we did during that year and a half was work and study and test. Um, you have about five years, I think, of the rolling clock to take your test before you lose one. And we, you know, got all kinds of advice from wonderful people, including Terry Canada, about what the best way is to kind of get, be successful with those exams. And it really is to just focus and run the marathon. And so we did that. Um, it was tough. It was hard saying, no, I can't socialize this weekend. Yeah. No, you know, go to that party or, you know, um, even with work, just the balance of, you know, I have to use some of my PTO for study time. Mm -hmm. um, but when you get that last pass, because I had to take, it was seven exams. I think now it's six. So that's at least better. There's not as many, <laughs> um, but there were seven exams I had to take. And when I got the last pass, it was wonderful. I actually, my husband and I were happy to be on vacation in Seattle. It was my birthday. I to my email, I got the pass. I'm pretty sure I cried for a couple hours. The most, <laughs> <laughs> and we went out and celebrated. Um, and yeah, that that was the process. But it was the the balance of all of that is mm -hmm. is really tough. The way that the study kind of takes over the even the extra time that you have to balance it outside of work. But if you can kind of put the blinders on and focus and say, look, I'm going to give myself six months or I'm going to give myself one year and this is going to be my number one priority, then you can you can do it. And it does kind of take that level of like focus and intensity. At least it did for me. Yeah. Um, how was it working with Phil Freelon? It was great. Um, and it was great because Phil was, you know, Phil, he is basically an, an icon, right? Especially for African-American architects. Mm -hmm. But the also the wonderful thing is people that he selected to kind of work within the freelance group. So it wasn't just about, you know, Phil was, was awesome and visionary and just, um, you know, could tell the story for a project in a way that would could move a room to tears, right? But then the people that you end up working with around Phil too were also just so, so wonderful. And so that um, I, got, I got to experience that sense of investment and that sense of legacy and the importance of all of that in the profession very quickly. And again, like Zena Howard and Terry Canada, I got to work with both of them because, you know, Phil accepted all of us into his firm. Um, I worked with Zena Howard on the Motown Museum renovation in Detroit. Um, and Terry is just, I could go on and on about Terry. She's a wonderful mentor to me um, and friend. And uh, yeah, so I think working with him landmark and then just the people around him that are also landmark and doing wonderful things just just made it I just feel very blessed and fortunate I know not everybody gets that and I feel very fortunate to have had that so can you tell me just a little bit about your activity in like the national and local architecture organizations 
Yeah, sure. Um, so I will start with AIA um, Triangle. Mm -hmm. I think when I was an intern or before I was licensed, I was working really hard, <laughs> a lot of hours in the firm, but I was looking for a way to also be engaged with my local community and the local architecture community. Uh, Cause sometimes we can get, again, when we put the blinders on, um, you know, you can get really hyper-focused on what's going on within the four walls of your office and, mm -hmm. and start to lose sight of a, a bigger picture. So I wanted to be a part of AIA Triangle and I thought a really interesting way to do that would be to volunteer to be a part of the design awards committee. Um, you know, it made sense. The firm had won a lot of design awards. So let's find out about this committee that makes all of it happen. Mm -hmm. um, so I have served on that to date for, I believe it's been five years, five or six years. So, and I'm the chair. So I waited my turn and did my work. And now I get to be chair, which is really wonderful during a pandemic. Yay. <laughs> Which is, which is really interesting, um, but the the way that I've been able to network with other architects also outside of the ones that I work with in the office every day has been phenomenal. Um, and then we're also picking up the charge of okay, now what's our face to the architecture community, but also what's our face outside of the architecture community. But what the Design Awards did was introduce me to some people that said, hey, we need some help with women in architecture, too. And I was like, well, that sounds amazing. And I definitely want to be a part of that and what how we can support women in architecture in the Triangle community. Um, so it was really through AIA Triangle that you start to meet people, you learn what others' interests are, and they have the support and infrastructure to help you continue to, you know, be the activist, be the volunteer, you know, be a lecturer, be all of these wonderful things in the architecture and design community. Um, and then from there, <laughs> I actually um, recently had a chance to reach out to um, NC Noma. They are there is a wonderful, wonderful kind of like refreshed group um, of leadership that NC Noma has. When I was in my younger years at Freelon, the professional chapter actually wasn't doing very much. Um, and so I realized that they had this group that's doing these amazing things that is on this, you know, kind of rocket ship trajectory. And I sat in on a couple of their meetings and, you know, they asked me, what do you know, how can you help? And I was like, well, I, I have all these connections with AIA. This is how I think I can help you because even nationally, those two organizations are working together. And so bringing that to a level at North Carolina is is really, really helpful and something we wanna mimic. So I work with them to kind of work with AIA North Carolina to make wonderful events and things happen. And all in all of that, it's come back around like full circle to the charge that we need more diversity in the practice of architecture in North Carolina. And I think those two groups, and I'm glad I can be a part of facilitating the interactions between those two groups that helps push that mantra forward. So. So yeah, that, that's kind of how I ended up getting involved. It all started with an email and went from there. <laughs> okay, so just one last question before we kind of um, shift gears. Can you give me just like, well, what's one word of advice that you would give a young girl that wants to pursue architecture or just like any other type of crew? Yeah, well, so for architecture specifically, I always, I don't know if this is advice or some sort of like um, support or inspiration, mm -hmm. but um, I always tell young black women that want to be architects in the United States and all over the world even, but that there is still a chance to make history. And we need your voice. We need your experiences. We need your swag. We need your style. We need it all. All of who you authentically are in this profession. When I got my license, I believe I was the 11th or 12th African-American woman to become licensed in the state of North Carolina. And that to me was in one way exciting because it feels historic. I mean, that's under 20, right? But in another way, it's incredibly disheartening because this is 2020. There should be, and it wasn't 2020 at the time, but there should be more and there needs to be more so that we can have the representation in the profession that's reflective of the people that we serve and the communities that we serve. Mm -hmm. I would say it, the, the profession, it is a marathon. If you love architecture, commit to the marathon. There's so many levers and opportunities you can pull within the profession. It is, it is gonna take 
um, a village of support to navigate, but you can do it. Commit to the marathon, run the marathon. We are here, wonderful women here, ready to run with you and greet you as you cross over into licensure and all of that. So stick with it. You can still make history and we really need you and we're excited to have you as part of the profession of architecture. Okay, so to kind of shift gears a little bit, um, my dad approached me and asked me how architecture and music business were the same and how they were different. And that's think about it at first. And both are very much so works of art, but they both go through a specific type of process. So tonight, another special guest we have, um, I'd like to introduce to y'all the Grammy nominated singer songwriter, Eric Robertson. Hey, how you doing? I'm good, how are you? I am good, good. I'm enjoying the conversation. <laughs> Thank you for um, joining. My parents are huge fans of you guys <laughs> and I've been listening to you since I was like four or five. Wow, that's a good thing. Yeah, you got some great parents. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess this is gonna just be a conversation between the three of us, but it's more so I just wanna hear you guys um, just aspects of the design process and like the music making process and how both very they use specific types of processes but you both need input from other people so mm -hmm. i just want um first off for you to tell us about your um join the process program so uh, about four years ago we started um a site it was initially a, a private facebook page but then moved on to patreon where what it is is every idea that I come up with or create, um, I let the people witness how we started the idea and how we carry it all the way into um, whether it lands on another artist or we make an album. We've made, I think, four albums right in mm -hmm. front of the people. It's grown to about a thousand people now um, as members. And it's a lot of fun because you, you get a chance to see what works and what doesn't work right away. Um, and it's probably the way I'm gonna do music from now on. And it's it's interesting because now it's it's grown way beyond just me doing music. It's about just in general, us trusting the process of whatever we're working on, that's parenting, marriage, education, you know, philanthropy or music, uh, but really understand if you have an idea, carry it all the way and, and always maintain what's the purpose of it, like hold on to the purpose of it. So it's the driving force to get you through your process. And I know that architecture and music are both very similar. So I guess both of you guys can um, kind of explain the process and how you both think it's similar. So well, you can, I, yeah, you can go first. Well, I would just want to add to what Eric said about you know this this part where you you show people the process so that they can see what's successful and what's not and why and bringing them like, you know, the idea that, you know, you're not sitting across from the table from someone trying to look perfect and make it look like it's done, but you're bringing them to your side and really integrating, rolling up your sleeves and elbow to elbow with everybody in the process. And that is the way that we like to practice architecture. And I like to practice architecture, we do at our firm. We bring our clients in, in a way that they are on the same side of the table with us and so that way we are it's not just about here's the picture of the building do you like it it's like all right let's start with the ideas like what are your hopes what are your dreams let's write them down on paper your dreams don't match their dreams that's okay we're gonna work that out <laughs> um and you know just that iterative like open process of creating and so at the end of the day i think with the product because you can be very selective. People can be like, I don't like that style or I do like this style. But what we're able to do is if we can get everybody on the same page and build consensus around what we're supposed to do, what the end goal is, then really the product is, as long as everybody knows the product is accomplishing that, you get buy-in from the whole group. So that creative process and bringing people along the way with that is definitely something that relates also between music and architecture. That is very cool, Eric. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we're, we're on the same page. I think it also, everything starts with the right foundation. Obviously with architecture at the same time, you can't start from the 10th floor up, you know, you kind of mm -hmm. have to make sure the ground is, is stable. Uh, from a music standpoint, we all also have to be on the same page. I, I think the best way also, uh, if I connect it to architecture, if I'm building a church, uh, I have to understand what it's for. So I'm not going to build certain spaces in it that won't 
facilitate the ministry or the congregation or anything of that nature. So the same point of if I'm working with a certain artist that her voice might have like rock and roll inflections, finding the right way to bring that out rather than bring in another feel. Or, or even if we say from a stage, I, I often tell the band, if I'm out front singing a sad song, the drummer can't be happy. <laughs> You know what I mean? We all gotta be sad. I can't. Mm -hmm. I can't be on the front like, how can she do this? And he's back there like, it doesn't <laughs> work that way. You gotta. You gotta be a part because they look past me and go, why he's so happy? I don't believe the song. We all have to. So if we're if we're all committed to be inspired or to be happy or to be whatever, we all gotta sign in to feed the process of understanding that we're getting to something. And and you know, I don't know how much this is a term for for architecture because architecture is very product based, but I, I live off a term process over product. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, if you trust the process, the product will take care, take care of itself. Um, because in, in music, we often can allow doubt because we're going through uncertainty, obviously, right? When we're diving in, will this work? But to me, it's all about finding out, uh, go, going through your process to find out, will it work? Because at the end of the day, uh, you know, uh, Tommy Davidson told me this great thing, com great comedian. He said, the only person who knows what works is God. And the only person to show you what will work is the crowd. Mm -hmm. So why why are we holding back when technically we don't know if it's going to work? So you got to get to your answer, you know? So, so I'm very much, uh, I'm very much a process person to get to the product. Yeah. And I would say it's very much the same with architecture and design. Again, I know the, the final product is, is the, the walls, right? It's the hard thing that you experience, but there is a lot of ideas and testing of ideas along yeah. the way. Um, there's actually, even artfully, if you see some of the, the sketches and the diagrams and things, just walked into a room and saw that in the beginning of the process, it wouldn't make sense, right? It almost reminds me of, like you're saying, when you're meeting someone and you're hearing, learning what their strengths and weaknesses are in their voice and their tones, you know, it's the same thing. You know, we have all of these different agendas and goals and missions and people have been thinking about this building forever, you know, for, you know, decades. And it's, this yeah. is the time to do it and implement it. Um, but even within that, we we're pulling all that information together. We're testing, okay, what if we do this? Or what if we do that? And what if we, yeah. that is form making and we're testing that too and pushing the envelope on those things. Um, yeah. And then it kind of lands in what you, what you see built. So there's definitely a lot of relationships and correlations there. That's good. So do you see um, your music, I guess, getting a better, reaction from the crowd when you get there in, inspecting what they want in a song from you, I guess, or when they're involved in it? Do you get a better reaction or do you feel as though the song is better with them being involved in it? There's two things. So, you know, for me, when you have a, a like, let's say a, a song that I wrote 20 years ago and it's somebody's song, they've been waiting all night for that song to come on, mm -hmm. you know, there, there's a certain connection that we don't even realize because they may be in North Carolina and they've lived this song. I've never seen them before, but now I'm learning of this connection right in front of me. Uh, this couple fell in love over this song or you you mended mm -hmm. your broken heart over this song. So there's a, there's a natural just connection in the fact that when we send it out, it, it has like some kind of history that we might fortunate, hopefully be fortunate enough to learn when we, when we, when we witness it. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you know, I, I love to do improv. So every show I do, we make a song up from scratch. And and I, that's really just an example of showing that it's really teamwork. At the end of the day, if the crowd doesn't show up, it's just a dress rehearsal then at that point. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So the same way we need the security, we need the vendors, we need everything for everything to work. The sound engineers, the, light, the lighting people, as well as the crowd for, for everything to really work. I can't me as the artist who might, my name might be on the marquee, is no more important than anything else if nothing else shows up. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I think when you realize that it's a full synergy, I think when we make up the songs, we take words from the crowd and we make it into a song to show that, hey, we're all doing this. Because how you how you see it is what makes it art. You know, the conversations that come from it. Wow, you know, I remember that song. That, that song reminded me of this. That's what makes the song art, you know? So... Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I'm always trying to make that connection. 
So with architecture, um, have you ever had, I guess, like a customer give you an idea and then they just change their whole mind completely and you have to start from scratch or like mm. finding something and like it doesn't really work out. So you have to come up with another way to, I guess, implement it without tearing apart the whole plan. Yeah. So there's a there's a few ways that we um, we contend with that. Mm -hmm. um, one way, I guess. So through our, our design process, we kind of have to expand that. So we can't. We can't come into a project with assumptions about, you know, or we try not to, we peel back, we come with expertise, but we try not to come in with assumptions about what it's gonna be, what they need, what it's gonna look like. Um, for example, if you came to me and you told me you needed to do a, you know, you wanted to do a school, that's fine. We can talk about what grade did it, what grade level and everything it is. But what we wouldn't want to do is come in and say, OK, well, I've seen these schools and I we've done these schools in the past. So what they want is just like a modified version of this, because I think when you get when you when you push an agenda from that perspective and you're not kind of open minded to see what the client actually wants. Mm -hmm. um, their version of it is, right? Every school is different. Every school culture is different. The groups of students that come through the neighborhood are different. And you know, you need to design to respond to those things. It's all a unique opportunity. Um, so when we expand our process in the front end to really try to capture all of those ideas and those unique things without putting the cart before the horse, so to speak, it helps us avoid later down the line, a situation where it's like, wait, I don't like this do it over again. And again, and that's all improved by when you bring the client along with you, when you bring the community along with you, when you don't just say, hey, community, let me unveil, here's the design. Mm -hmm. It's more like, okay, let's have a community meeting one. Let's talk about what the vision is. Let's get their thoughts on the vision. Let's get their thoughts on the keywords. Go back, do some work. Come back and say, okay, here's where we are based on what you all said. And then you take them along with you so that you kind of, it becomes their project. It becomes a shared passion between the architect and who you're serving. And then at the end of the day, it becomes theirs and they end up loving it. Um, so, so yeah. And I, I did want to add about the music piece when you said that there are, you know, songs that are tied to life. I can think even with architecture school, it's such, it's a very like heads down, even the design process can be like very heads down drawing or, you know, you're looking at things and you kind of need to close out the world just so you can like think through some of the design and the creativity. And I have like, there's always an album or something <laughs> or a song wow. repeat that I can remember. That's how I remember these different phases in my life. It's like, oh, when I was working on that studio project, I was listening to like Lauren Hill all on, on repeat, that one song, because that was the thing that was just, you know, that created the, the audible space that I needed to focus and work yeah. through. So it's, it's really cool. That's <laughs> so, it. Do you find, do you guys find it difficult when like, I guess if a client comes to you and they don't really give you like a lot about what they want, they just say, this is exactly like, this is something that I'm looking at. Just, I guess, do something or like when it comes to a song and you don't really have any inspiration, but like, I guess you haven't gotten any like feedback from the crowd. Like, do you find it difficult when it comes to being able to write a song or making a building or drawing out a floor plan? Uh, I, I can jump in. I mean, we do, you know, I've written songs for TV shows or for movies and times. And, and I, with that, you know, most times you're going to have a lot of detail. I, I tell you a funny story. This is some years ago. We were doing, me and my good friend, Dana Saray, great, great producer. Uh, we're doing a commercial for, I think, Hallmark uh, through an agency. And we probably did probably 30 songs to this commercial. They shot a whole commercial and then they decided to make a whole change of the commercial and, and base it around, more around the child than, the, than like the mom. So then we had to write a whole nother songs. And by the time we finished, um, I think we had just missed the Christmas period and it was like, they moved it and scratched it for like next year. But it was more just because they didn't really know what they wanted. They were like, well, we kind of like this. We kind of like that. And, and I, we were laughing about it just recently just it was such a learning lesson for us because we were really chasing this idea, but we didn't know what we were chasing. So we just kept creating, kept creating. And I probably have a whole Christmas album recorded, you know, from just ideas for this commercial that we never, that we never used. So, I mean, yeah, it, it helps to kind of have some kind of, kind of plan. If I'm producing for an artist, 
I want to know what they're dealing with, what they're going through. I use an example, say Vivian Green is an artist, uh, and I worked on her first album. And if you listen to the first album, she was going through a breakup. So that first album is really defined of that heaviness of our heart. We couldn't make an album of happiness because that's not where she was at, you know. And it was a timeless. I mean, I think there was some timeless records made, but it was true because we took a minute to have a conversation first. And if and if you if you came in the studio crying, not saying she was, but if you came in sad or upset, let's talk about it for a second, and then let's write it on to make you feel better. Not we can't walk in like everything's fine and I'm just perfect when when it wasn't. So I think it, it helps to kind of take a minute to see where people are at and get some kind of vision so you can make something that fits. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we were in the car and like a music soul child song came on and I just, I think we were just sitting in the car listening to the song and it was like some of like the stuff he was like saying and singing like reminded me of like some of the stuff you would sing and um, talk about in some of your songs. And then I just heard you singing in the chorus and I was like, oh wait, that makes so much sense. <laughs> so yeah, I, I understand I'm, the whole, you gotta have a plan of what you want to do. Cause if not, it's like, you don't know what, you're doing it for, and then it's it, it it doesn't help that since you don't know what you're doing it for, you're just doing it, and then sometimes it might not even just end up getting used. But but I and I want to make sure I say it right. Verse is that right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. So so I do have a question. Not to jump on your toes, Morgan, because you're doing a great job. But I was I was curious with architecture. Do mistakes or do mistakes sometimes lead to great architecture? Like do like you know? I would think that everything has to line up correctly with architecture, which is which is where we probably would differ. Like we we hope to get lost musically because finding our way back leads us to this different place musically. We're like, wow, this is crazy. With 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 architecture, do mistakes sometimes lead to like brilliant designs? So I don't know. I don't so I don't know if I can call them mistakes that we do. <laughs> um, it would be more just like unearthing and like the some of the challenges. And you know, when you talk about how you have to get to know your client, we do have clients sometimes that say, we want to do a building. We can do a building. We don't know what goes in it. We just know it's going to be awesome for the community. You know, they only have that sense of two things. And so we have to work with them to figure out um, what questions to ask, what activities to do, you know, try to, you know, pull and do this information out of them in a way that makes all of that successful. I think in the midst of that process, this is there's some challenges that do arise. And when we are doing our, like, when we're testing in the very early phases of design, um, I think, you know, there are times where I guess we get it wrong. Um, yeah. And, you know, cause we'll have this option A, B and C, and this is what we think we heard and this is how we translated it. And here it is when we start to actually get into something that looks built, like it's going to look like it's gonna be built. Um, and that's when people are like, oh wait, <laughs> Oh, this is, you know, this is the one or that's the one. And, and that would be the part where we kind of have to go back and, okay, let's talk about what's here. What do you like about what's here? Let's pull that apart and pick that apart, pull the good things, pull the things you don't like out and rethink and bring it back together. Um, but I would say, you know, through design, through the process overall, it's a lot of people in and out. I mean, we're architects are one part, but as I mentioned, you have a client and usually I refer to them singularly, but usually it's a bigger group of people. You have the people that are going to actually use the building in the end. You have your engineers, you have your contractor, you have your trades people that are built. Like you have, there's so many people. And so mistakes, I think in a way are, are bound to happen and our process is set up so that we can start to get ahead of those um, and make sure that we can manage those. But at the end of the day, um, you know, building and building science and technology is something that's always evolving. You know, we don't build buildings the same way that we did, you know, three decades ago even. And that's because we've learned from some mistakes, right? Where we have poor air quality and we're using materials that aren't sustainable and, you know, LED, lead paint every, you know, we 
learn from, I would call some of those things, those are the mistakes that we've learned from over time that with each project that we do, talking with the end user about how everything's performing, what they like, what they don't like, we learn from that. It's, we're not gonna get it perfect every time, but we hope with everything that we do moving forward, it will get better and better. But yeah, there's not this like, not as much this looseness of like, let the mistake kind of, unfortunately, <laughs> let the mistake take you somewhere. It's like, fix that mistake. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I'm, I guess what I was just wondering is like, not like a mistake, but like, have you ever just like, I guess you thought you knew what the client wanted, like they put out what they want, but then I guess you just created something completely different and they ended up liking that more than their original plan? Or is it always like, once they give you what they want and it's not what they want, they want it exactly to be like that? Yeah, it's it's kind of up to the client. Um, a lot of times, again, when we take them on the journey with us, um, you know, we like to tell them, hey, we under we understand what you're looking for and we're gonna, you know, use what we use and our talent as creatives and designers to kind of, we're gonna try to enhance your vision. We're gonna keep it in budget and all that, but we're gonna enhance your vision. We wanna sort of surprise you with what we deliver. I think some of that in the same way that a song can sort of surprise you as you're maybe like mm -hmm. listening to certain notes and you think it's, you think when you start, it's gonna go one direction, but you kind of like let it pull you wherever it wants wants to go. There's definitely yeah. some of that in design and, and what we do. Um, so yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think, I think, I think it happens. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think people may call, if they call me for a certain word, they're calling because they trust that I can probably bring something out or bring something to the table or bring something out of them. So I, I mean, at the end of the day, I am kind of there to challenge them to think a little bit out of the box. And every once in a while, there's going to be, you know, some kind of uh, bounce back. Oh, I don't really hear that or whatever. And, and you got to say, well, I, I mean, let's give it a try. We're here mm -hmm. and you never know. And sometimes more, more times than not, after it's done, they can kind of understand the vision. And you'll have plenty of songs. There's, I mean, we can go down the list of artists who said, when I heard it, I hated the song. And now they're singing it for the rest of their lives and they love it. And it's, it's the biggest hit they had in their careers. So, you know, it just, it, it, it happens, but you, there's a fine line of like, you know, um, okay, I see what you want. So let me bring that out. Or I hear something totally different that I know you can do. There's, there's a trust factor on both sides. So, yeah. you know, I think with architecture, hey, I trust you because I may have a vision that I want a building I might not know exactly what I want because technically if I knew everything I wanted, I would just go ahead and build it. But clearly I'm not an architect. So yeah. I'm calling you for your expertise to kind of yeah. bring my dreams into a tangible form. Yeah. And I'll just add to that really quickly. I think, you know, in that trust building with the client, the idea is not to ignore them as Eric's saying, but it's just like, we, pr we present options. And so yeah. there may be one or two. So one is like, okay, if we, we want to have an option that really speaks to what, like if the client's like, I want something really traditional as far as stylistic, for whatever reason, you know, we'll do an option that sort of starts to speak to that. But then we kind of do an in-between and maybe something that really pushes the envelope. So that way we can have that conversation across the spectrum and across scales and talk about the benefits between each of them. And so they understand that you're hearing them and they also start to understand your process of translating and how yeah. you can take them from what they thought they could get to something with the higher level, I think. I agree. Okay, so I guess with um, you being a singer songwriter and then with being um, an architect, how many, like, I guess, floor plans or songs have you just had to just throw away and just say forget it because either the person you were writing for just felt like it just wasn't right for them or they just said, never mind, or just, yeah. You never throw it away. <laughs> you never throw it away. I mean, I have, if, if, if we're talking about from that way, I have blueprints laying all around this house. You know, if that's the case, there's blueprints literally laying right here. And, you know, hopefully you'll, you know, it, the tough part is uh, being a songwriter is your favorite song is the, the next one, you know? So every once in a while, you do need to go back and say, wow, what about that other idea I had, you know, two years ago? Let me, let me see if I can kind of, figured out because what I always say about songwriting, sometimes you don't have the rest of the song. I, I always say that you you write to your empty and you you read to your full and then you write to your empty and you read to it. So if ever I'm at a point where I didn't finish a blueprint, it's because I need to live a little bit more. 
I need to read a little bit more, do do some other stuff and find some inspiration. So there's they're documented all over the place, but I I, I don't I'm not a I'm not a believer of like you just completely scratch it, you know. Uh, at, at the same time, I've had songs that I thought were going to be huge hits that were going to pay off my house, and I was going to I'm on by the bottom Mercedes. This is the one, and no one pays attention to it. And the, and the little song that I did just before I went to bed, sitting at the piano for you know playing around, that's the one everyone wanted. So you can't throw away that that even small idea because the small idea might end up being the next huge bridge or you know building in the biggest building in some business district you know so yeah. i would say it's similar for architecture um one thing you'll notice even when you start studying is that they'll encourage you to have a sketchbook and you're supposed to use that sketchbook to capture all of the ideas good bad otherwise and I actually, there's been a couple of projects even when I was in practice, um, there was a scheme that I liked better and you know the owner and the team generally wanted went in a different direction. They went with the B instead of the A. And I really liked the A. So what I did, <laughs> I just went home and I just kept working on the A and then worked on the B when I was at work. Wow. Um, but my friend, I have a really good friend um, and mentor and colleague, in, um, Edwin Harris, and he always says design is a muscle. And you know you have to continue to to use it and to exercise it. And so I agree with Eric. Like you know, yes, technically yes, there are floor plans that and ideas and visions that kind of don't get built. That's probably a better way to put it. But that doesn't mean that you can't continue to explore them and investigate them because there's certainly everything is a learning experience, and there are certainly ideas and themes that start to come out of that process that will absolutely influence the work that you do in the future so nothing is like a waste of time or a total scrap in it you know it's all yeah. learning yeah design is a muscle i'm using it i like that <laughs> so i guess like um your cancel 2020 song was it was very <laughs> like right on time and like architecture and music are just like a very timely thing so like how did that whole song just come about that song was written the night that uh, Chad Bozeman passed uh, from cancer. And I, I got the news like everyone else got. Um, it was really, really floored. I had a fortunate opportunity going to Howard University and Chad was, I want to say a freshman. I was a junior, I think when he got there and I was blown away by his talent, like everyone else was. And I wasn't one, any bit surprised that, that he was, you know, going to be a huge, huge superstar in the future. Uh, so to get that news for me, songwriting is also like a way for me to heal. It's it's where I escape to when I have a tough day. So that night before, and and I don't I don't know if I went downstairs to like write this cancel twenty twenty song. I just went downstairs once the kids went to sleep to just write just to get my mind off of things, and it was what I came up with. And I and it was crazy because um, I did the song with DJ Jazzy Jeff. And another guy named Cody Tatum, they sent they sent me some music just in general. So I heard the music. I was like, oh, let me write to this one. And that's what I wrote. And then I think at three o'clock in the morning, whenever I was finished with it, I just posted it like on Instagram. Not even like I should at least call Jeff and all them guys. But I was like, it helped me feel better. It might help somebody else feel better. Air, whoever wants it, because I wasn't really thinking much about it. And I think I woke up the next morning with like you know, a, a hundred text messages and a thousand comments and, you know, some crazy amount of views and mm -hmm. celebrities were like DMing me, like, where can I get this song at? And I think people related to it because we all were hurting, you know, we, and, and I mean, this year has year has been tough. We lost a lot of heroes. We lost friends and we've been stuck in the house, you know, all year. So I think people just related to it. And I, and I think that's the thing where sometimes you just got to be honest. It's got to be honest where you feel and go with your heart and I, I, I mean I don't, I don't think we were really concerned about business or anything of that nature and, and we had you know probably one of the biggest records to, of my of, for me for that year just out of something that would just let my let my heart speak you know so how was it attending Howard oh it's phenomenal I should strongly advise everyone to go you know you know it's a uh, now I would tell you Howard was great, and I would say that, I mean I had some amazing professors. You know, there's a great history there. You know, I, of course I was in the fine arts program, 
I had, you know, Donnie Hathaway's English teacher, you know, and and so my teachers were like Felicia Rashad's classmates and stuff like that. So, you know, I mean, it was really magical in those classrooms, but I also tell you those dorms in the, in the yard, there was a lot where, we, you know, I, I'm not surprised by all the stuff that people were able to accomplish because it, I think just the culture there of, you know, how many mover and shakers were there before you. So there's a responsibility of like networking and sharing. So even when me and my wife were just talking about that, when we're in London, when I'm in South Africa, I run into people from Howard. You know, it's like wherever I go, it's not just running into somebody. You run into somebody who's in charge of this or doing this, or, you know. So um, I think it's great, man. I think there's and I think probably a lot of the HBCUs can all say the same. You know, if you had someone here from Hampton or, or Alcorn State, you know, Grambling, whatever, I'm sure they can say the same thing. But there was a lot of magic. And I, and I would tell you one of the things for me. A valuable lesson was so Marlon Wayans, one of the Wayans brothers, mm -hmm. was at Howard University. He came in probably the year before me, but he was in class and the whole nine. And he shot a movie. He did a movie called Mo Money with his brother, a, a national movie. And then the movie's out and he came back to school. And he's sitting in class with like one of the biggest movies out. You know what I mean? And it was a valuable lesson like of, of humility of also like making sure you're learning while you're expressing mm -hmm. that 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 he could have easily not not came back and i mean obviously eventually his popularity and, and success really pulled him away but it was a valuable lesson of like you you can do all things like you, you always constantly learn always you know but that was howard it wasn't it wasn't that surprising nor was he treated any differently when he was walking across the campus he was just another guy but he just happened to have a movie out you know so there, there was a lot of dope stuff, man. I mean, I kind of, I see, I see the comments out here. People say HBCU uh, love and and shouting their schools out and stuff. But it was, it was great. It was great. I love the time. Yeah, I applied and I find out in two weeks if I get. You're in. going. You're going. <laughs> I congratulate you in advance. It's one of my top schools, and then that's my sister's like number one school. Like she's a sophomore in high school, and she's automatically said, "Morgan, you can't go to this school because this is where I want to go." But y'all no, y'all should both go. You, yeah, you should definitely go so you can bet it out before she gets there, you know? Yeah, I think no, I think you you both I, I suggest everyone go go to uh, Howard. <laughs> well, I just want to thank you guys both for joining me tonight and letting me interview and just having this wonderful conversation. It's an honor. You did a great job. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you for having us. Um, when, I, when I need my building built, I'm calling you. Please do. Seriously. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just want to thank everybody for watching. And I um, ask that you guys follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Black Rose Draw. And make sure you buy our merch because I know we're going to start selling sweatshirts now since it's getting cold outside and some long sleeve shirts. So, yeah. I just wanted to thank you guys again for joining. And I will see you guys next month. Have a fantastic holiday and thank you very much no okay. problem great job take care now thank you bye, bye.